Tyler. Tyler. Winston, what's going on, man? Oh, you know, we are back at it another week. Another net lease asset. Here, let me figure out how to uh, get our turn faces on there. Here. Yeah, yeah. You think so? You're good looking. After, ah, there you go. There's the beard. Uh, you know it. Um, you think after like 20, 20 of these, I would be able to work the technology, but lately, is this yeah. number is this number 20 already? Are we no, I don't know. what number are we? I've got to be close to that, I think. If it's not, uh, let's say like 14. Uh, my okay. guess is 14, but we we'll can see. check and see. All right, so who do we have uh, today, Tyler? All right, so this week um, it's a bit of a different a different one for sure. Uh, we we do a lot of retail or medical uh, medical office net lease type stuff uh, here. Usually when we do this, uh, this time we have an, an our second and only our second industrial um, asset that we're looking at here. So who we're looking at today is it's a net lease asset. Um, the tenant is Bureau uh, Verditas. I think I'm, I'm saying that correctly. It's a, a Bel Belgian company, so probably definitely butchering that pronunciation. Um, so, but it's based in Pasadena, Texas, which is just south of Houston. Um, they're a company. They do they do a lot of things. They have 85,000 employees. But what they do specifically at this location, this is their North American headquarters um, for testing and certification. So, you know, they've been there since 2003, I believe, is when this building was was uh, built for them, and they've been there, you know, 20 years already. Um, can I share my screen here, Winston? Show a little bit about these guys. Yeah, man. Here, it's not popped up to to ask me uh, to okay. share your screen yet. No, throw it up here. Um, yeah, so these guys are here. They're right in the middle of an area close to Houston, um, just surrounded by refineries. So this is an interesting case because here you have a very, this is you know the front of the building. You have a very strong tenant. Um, they're in an area, you know, you know, what you think about, you know, oil refineries and the oil and gas business, you know, it's not, you know, the booming growth, uh, super profitable business that it was in, you know, the seventies and eighties. Um, you know, just for, just for a little bit of background, I worked, uh, eight years in the oil and gas industry. So I've spent a lot of time around these oil and gas, um, industrial parks. You know, I've been in these certification buildings. Um, I've seen, you know, what goes on in, in these areas. Um, this is a massive area for this type of stuff. So I wouldn't expect this tenant to go anywhere anytime soon. Um, they've been there for 20 years. They've just signed another 10 years on the lease. Um, you know, they, they, they're probably, you know, backed up no matter what happens in the industry, they're gonna be backed up because certification and testing and, and that kind of stuff has only, you know, gotten, even though the industry itself might, might not be in growth, Testing and certification has only increased as health and safety standards have improved over the years. So, you know, something like this, you would expect you would expect them to stick around. So, when we underwrite this, um, you know, when we underwrite this tenant, and just look here, you have the you have the area here, and then you click refineries, and you have refinery, 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 refinery. It's all oil and gas all over the place here. So, when you underwrite something like this, super strong tenant, um, very unlikely to leave. Um, when we get into the underwriting itself, there's like going to be a few interesting details to talk about, um, if they do leave, but you know, just, just super high class tenant for uh, an industrial park, in my opinion. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you know, I'm looking at it. They, they, they are a credit rated tenant, right? I mean, they're, they're, I think they have, uh, so we can review their, their financials. You have kind of a clear, um, you know, way to go and review their review their financials, but look at their health and stability, right? Uh, being a credit tenant. So that's excellent. Um, good deal here. So what else? Uh, anything else? Do you, have you heard of them? Like, are you are they well known? Did you, did I hear you say that you know? Them? Yeah, when when I mean, it's been several years since I worked in oil and gas. But when I saw the name, it immediately I immediately remembered. I think, I, you know, I've seen them do like sling certifications, container certifications um pipes but i think they do just put everything so i mean that's big like absolutely anything that goes on in i think in a lot of these industries but i, I know specifically in oil and gas anything everything is certified yearly they have five-year certifications they have um you know three quarterly certifications for some things so these these things are, are, are just consistent revenue for companies like this um yeah. and that's everything right that's chains that's lifting slings that's containers that's equipment that goes that 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 holds pressure that's equipment that goes down hole that's absolutely everything so 
you know, there's there's never going to be a, a, a lack of revenue for a company like this if they're, you know, the best at what they do. Um, and, 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 you know, with 85,000 employees in the, in the base that they have, they're, they're pretty good. So, yeah, that's excellent. I'm looking here. It says they have over 1400 locations across the world. You know, as you said, 85,000 um, employees, you know, it's, it's a big company. It's a strong company. You know, people have their opinions of oil and gas. Um, but I think we can all agree that's probably not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Um, you also have the 22,000, 729 square foot building that you know in essence is an office space uh we don't know what it looks like on the inside but it's in a great area a large industrial area and as people talk more and more about onshoring for for these uh you know more and more industrial companies you know i can't imagine a situation where you're going to have um a problem kind of retinning this but we can talk more about that later but excellent Excellent. Well, well good yeah. stuff on them. Um, do we, did we talk about the location? You, you talked about it being close to refineries. You know, how is it um, as far as the accessibility to, you know, um, highways and, you know, the getting in and out and the access, accessibility to, you know, just, just ease of traffic? Yeah, let's look at it right here, right? So here's Houston. Um, here you have kind of the Houston port area. Uh, this is, you know, just off of the Pasadena freeway, um, you know, easy access. What is that? Um, 300 feet to the Pasadena freeway. And then that's going to take you over to this air port area. And also you can get down on the Gulf freeway, which is going to take you down into this. Um, where am I looking for here? Freeport, the whole oil and gas area, Galveston. There we go. Galveston. So this whole area down here, Galveston, I mean, you have, you have ships going in and out all the time. Um, oil rigs, what have you. Um, so it's, it's pretty well connected both to, in, into, you know, all, all of the coastal areas around Houston. It, it's it's easy access onto the highways there. Great. Well, fantastic. Well, let's get into the numbers. Okay. So, you know, as we were, as we were saying, um, as when you were saying before, right? so it's a 22,000 square foot building. I believe the makeup of the building is something like 50% office space, 50% lab, lab space, which is, is pretty typical um, in these like oil and gas industrial parks. I remember we used to have, we used to have a lot of space like that where you'd have, um, you know, the engineers where they would sit would be the kind of the office area. Maybe it's like 20 or 30%. And you'd have like a 70% warehousing and lab area where a lot of testing goes on, where a lot of equipment is held uh, in between testing and stuff like that. So I, I would assume it, it's a, it's a similar setup. Um, so they're asking, this is uh, you know, they do $500,000 a year in, in that operating income. They're asking 7.5 million for this. There's 10 years on the lease with two two renewal terms. Um, it's a triple, absolute triple net lease. So they're responsible for everything. And this new lease started in November uh, 22. So there's you know a little less, I guess a little bit less than, than 10 years left on that lease. Um, it's a 2.6 acre lot. So you've, you know, you've got a lot of area outside of just the 20,000 square foot building. Excellent. Um, one thing, so one thing that's interesting about this, maybe I'll talk about this. I'll talk about this after because, uh, okay, well, no, I'll talk about it right now. So the lease bumps on this are terrible. Um, the lease bumps are 1.75% every five years, not per year, every five years. Um, and then the two renewal options, and I'll talk about those after, but I actually think they're going to be zero. I don't think there's even going to be the 1.75% on the two renewals when that happens. And the reason for that is that the clause, so the clause on this lease is that it has a 1.75% bump at year five. And then on the two renewals, it has, it has uh, an update to market rate or it'll stay what it is, right? So if you look right here, market rate for this area um, I found five what I think are reasonable comps in this 20,000 square foot-ish, um, you know, industrial park. They're all around 10 bucks a square foot. This one is, uh, is that 23? I can't remember. Something like that. It's all, it's over 20. It's like $22 a square foot um, is what they're paying on, on, on this lease right now. So they're about double what you would call market rent. So when it comes time to renew, and it's, and, that, and you know, who defines market rent with this contract, you know, um, 
you know, you're double, you're, you're, you're already double. So there's essentially zero chance you're going to get those bumps um, at that time. So we just have to be very aware of this, that although this property is, is kicking off a large amount of NOI, there's not a lot of room for growth, right? And that matters a lot because a lot of times when you, you know, whatever you're going in cap rate is going to be on this 10 years from now, when you go to sell this thing, your disposition cap rate is not going to be quite as attractive as your, or it's going to be a little bit uh, higher than your going in cap rate. And a lot of times that's fine if you've had enough rental increase over the term so that 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 exit cap rate doesn't doesn't kill you on the back end, right? Because if you're if you're getting two percent a year every year for ten years, even though your cap rate is a little bit worse on the back end, you're still going to make money on the end. You're still going to um, make more money on the sale than you put in going in. But in this case, where the contract uh, rent is essentially flat for ten years, that with that little one point seven five percent increase um, on the back end, if you're using a disposition cap rate that's worse than what you're going in with, well, you're going to sell it for a lot less than you bought it for. So. You know, we have to be very careful when looking at these leases uh, and assessing how is the rent going to grow over the next, you know, 10 years, whatever the holding period is, because that's going to have a massive effect on how much money we're going to get out of it when we when we eventually dispose. So, Tyler, I, uh, that's a great, great explanation. And, you know, I'd like to add a little color here and not to get too off topic, but right before our call here, I was uh, talking to a broker where I'm representing the tenant um, in the in the negotiation of a lease. And we um, we were just talking about how the seller wants um, everything to go to market rate rent. Um, he also wanted five percent annual increases. Um, and I had said, no, thank you. Um, you know, basically we're going to do um, you know, I think my client will only agree to 2% a year max. And uh, we're not going to do market rate rent uh, because for the tenant, while it could be advantageous per se, um, they're going to have so much money invested in the location that they're renting that it's going to be difficult in, say, 10, 15 years to then say, you know what, uh, let's just let's just leave this current you know building we're in and go go reinvest all that money over here right so for from a landlord perspective yeah you know market rate could be good because it's not going to go down it's going to go up your your um your tenant could always say well i'll go elsewhere but the chances of them actually saying they're going to go elsewhere um if they've put significant amount of resources in the build out of a space and I would imagine that this space is um, was either built a suit or they came in and did some significant investments uh, to get it to exactly what they need. Right. So it's just funny hearing you say market rate right now. And I I was playing the opposite. Right. I said, absolutely not. You know, the tenant, we're not going to, to agree to market rate. Um. And because it's it's an unknown, no one knows, right? So anyway, yeah, that's that's interesting. It's, it's really interesting because the, the the market rate card, as you said, right? And in your situation, uh, it's this it's perhaps advantageous to the landlord, whereas in this situation, it would be advantageous to the tenant because it would depend. Like if you're starting off well above market rate and then you're capping it at market rate, that's great for the tenant. But if you were starting below, that would be great for the landlord because then they'd be able to jack it up, right? So it, I guess it's really just a question of, um, you know, how does your rate, initial term rate compare to the current market rate? What are your expectations? And then how much risk do you want to take on, right? Like how, how, how much are you willing to pay for, for certainty um, Absolutely. Know, with 2% with, with bumps versus risking it on uh, on what might happen? So. Yeah, and for, for us, and we can move on, but for us, it, this is not an industrial tenant. Um, it's a medical tenant and we think that we're getting kind of a med tell retail type uh, place, uh, probably a little bit below value, just a little bit below value. Um, and, um, so that's kind of why we're fighting that fight, right? We think, we think in five, 10 years, it, it has a chance to, to be higher. The, the seller also agrees, but, uh, and, and which is why he's trying to lock in 4% annual increases um plus market rate 
but you know, you, when you're when you are a tenant, you got to be careful of not paying, not agreeing today of what you think the market may be worth seven, eight, twelve years from now. But anyway, oh moving. great, great aside. Um, so just going back, and just before I leave there, so these are some sales comps as well, right? So this whole uh, you know ten, twenty dollars a square foot. Thing. These are a couple of sales comps that I found. This is NOI per square foot versus cap rate. So you can see that the cap rate they're asking for, the 6.7, is actually um, quite reasonable uh, versus what we found here, 7.5, uh, you know, mid sixes, whatever. But the NOI per square foot it just is killing me because, you know, this is $22 a square foot that they've got going on here. And then the other ones, again, in the same area, are looking around $10 a square foot. So it's about double. So, you know, as long as this tenant's stays that's not that much of an issue so if the tenant stays it's it's not an issue at all um you know you just have to worry about the cap rate but if they leave you end up in a situation where um well you end up in a really bad situation so let's talk about tenant leaving right now right so we're gonna assume um we're gonna do our disposition analysis at year 10 that's when the initial the initial lease term is up um i've got two scenarios here one is I'm giving it a 95% chance that they stay. I think I think it's pretty likely that they're going to stay, um, you know, given their operating history, their company size, uh, and just you know where they're situated and what they do. So if they stay, we're talking about the exit cap rate before, right? So I'm using an exit cap rate of 7.2. Um, that's 50 basis points higher than the 6.7 assumed going in, and I'm assuming that the rent will well, the rent will be what it is with that, that tiny 1.75% increase in year five. Um, you know, you're actually going to exit slightly less than you're going in. So I think it's 7.5 million they're asking. Well, you're only going to get 6.7 million at the end if you, you know, if these assumptions hold. And then the second scenario, which is even worse, is under the scenario where you have to retenant. So if you have to retenant, you might actually be able to exit at a, at a better cap rate, assuming, you know, you've got a fresh, a fresh lease in there. You've got, um, you know, you've done some repairs on the building. Uh, the building's in better shape. However, because those market rents appear to be significantly lower than the rent that Bureau of Rentas is paying, I would expect that the NOI at that point would be significantly lower. Uh, I'm using 400,000 here versus 500,000. So I'm, I'm putting a basically a 20% haircut on the on the rent. You know, I could be I could be off by quite a bit there, but I, I feel like it's unrealistic to think you would get the same market rent if this tenant leaves in this industrial park. I think that's pretty aggressive, but I don't, you know, I think you're, you have good points. Um, and that's really where analyzing the tenant and its credit uh, and getting comfortable with its lease term uh, is going to come into play. Right. There, it, it is often where you, you may buy an asset that you don't think um, you're going to get those same rents should they leave. Some people will take that risk. Some people will not. And we, and we discussed this, remember, I think we were looking at a Montessori school or, or a daycare in uh, just outside of Austin, Cedar Park. And it was kind of the same scenario, right? It was like, it's unlikely the tenant was going to leave. It was a really high NOI per square foot. But in the case that they did leave, it would be very unlikely for you to recover that, that same rent, right? So when these situations come around, like if you go down here and you look, okay, what's our, you know, what's our probability weighted average? of our net sales proceeds, right? It's actually not bad. It's actually very close to scenario one because we gave a 95% chance happening in scenario one and only a 5% to scenario two. So your weighted average is, you know, 100,000 less than your scenario one, right? So that second, you know, nightmare scenario doesn't actually kill the deal. It only kills the deal if you're unwilling to accept the downside should it happen, right? So this is one asset in a portfolio of 100 and you can eat those losses should this, you know, small probability event happen. That's fine. It's no problem. So, you, you, you know, I'd say, you know, buy the asset. But if it's the only asset you own and you can't by any means eat a $2 million loss on the back end, then even though it's only, a, let's say, a 5% chance of happening, you just can't buy the asset. So mm -hmm. whenever there's this high volatility in scenarios like this, um, you really just have to put into perspective of, of where this asset fits in your portfolio. And if the worst case scenario happens, if you can eat it or not. Yep. Um, all that being said, you know, let's have a look at the, the IRR analysis. So this is, this is assuming 
<laughs> it's pretty brutal. This is assuming uh, you buy at the cap rate they're asking and, and you know, goes through everything that we just discussed. Um, an unlevered IRR on the 10 years is uh, about 5.4%. Levered IRR 3.3. Why? Because what the borrowing rate is higher than the unlevered IRR. Um, I don't think we need to talk much more about about that. I mean, you know, this is these are awful returns. Um, if if you were to buy at the cap rate, they're asking. I don't know. I mean, do you, do you, would would someone buy this, Winston? Like, do you think this is a reasonable purchase anywhere, or should we just get to where we think the cap rate should be? Oh. Uh the question is would someone buy this yeah absolutely someone will buy this would even at at a 6.7 cap yeah i think so um you know what i think your question is the negative leverage right and that's that's really what i believe you're asking is will someone buy this with negative yeah, you're, leverage you're right you're right and and i believe that answer is most likely no um i think this is an all cash purchase i think when you're in negative leverage situations um, folks are going to most likely buy all cash. And that's what you're seeing in the marketplace in general today. Uh, you know, we, we're seeing more and more people just all cash offers, right? Uh, no need to leverage when it's going to hurt you. Uh, so, yeah, I just, I, I, you're, I think you're hundred percent. Whoever buys this probably will buy all cash. What concerns, what really concerns me though, is just the, even the unlevered IRR here at this cap rate um, is not good. And that's, and that's really a factor of the lack of rent, rent bumps, right? Um, the lack of rent bumps really hurt this. Like you have, you know, you have a 5.37. If I was to just, you know, we can just, we can play scenario analysis um, really quick. If you just had, you know, 2% a year, right? On the rent increases, that, that changes drastically this investment right your unlevered IRR just shot up to 7.3 right just because you have now have rent bumps mm -hmm. so not having not having rent increases um really hurts you and a lot of times that goes unnoticed people are fighting over you know 10 basis points 15 basis points on the cap rate i'll take 15 basis points on the cap rate if i can have two percent rent bumps uh, i mean it's 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 a no-brainer that the rent bumps are, are more important than, than a small change in the cap rate. I just wanted to to make sure that it's clear that the unlevered IRR here is doesn't look good, and and that's basically a product of the lack of uh, rent increase. Yeah. Um, you know, we had mentioned so you'd mentioned I didn't I didn't look this company up. Do you know their rate? Uh, did, what what their they're a public company. I don't know what their rating is. Um, uh, I do not know what their rating is. No. Okay. I would, I'm going to, you know, leave this at 7.5, 7.5 on the income cash flows and 8.5 on the decision. 7.5 would be similar to a, you know, double B rated public company. The reason in that 7.5, I'd probably be willing to change up or down a little bit um, after looking bet more at the company. But the disposition cash flow, I definitely uh, would want to have a higher a higher discount rate than the income cash flows for this company because of everything we discussed, right? The risk of having to retain it at a lower rate um, and everything that goes with that. So, you know, if you could, you know, you can play around with these numbers, how much you want to discount the income, how much you want to discount the disposition and come to a, a suggested cap rate. Um, it would be difficult, you know, let's say... Even if you ask for 6.5, well, it's, it's difficult uh, for me, like 6.5, you're up to a triple B, right? I don't think this company's triple B. I have to check. But, you know, it'd be difficult to come in on this thing at anything less than, yeah, you're not going to come in under a seven and a half cap, no matter what you do here with, the, with these with these cash flows. So if you were to buy this at something, you know, say an 8.05 cap, um, now you're getting levered cash flows that that are that are decent um you know with a 50 percent loan 7.5 percent uh loan rate you can get your unlevered up to about eight and you're levered up to 8.3 now there's a big difference between that and, and the cap rate that they're asking but at the same time uh unless you're as winston was saying right unless unless you're an all cash purchase and you're willing to take that 
you know, five point whatever percent unlevered IRR, I think it's going to be a hard sell to get this thing off the market at 6.7. Yeah, you know, I, I think it definitely trades better than a better than an eight cap. Um, that's my opinion. And it's somewhat of an ignorant opinion, you know, with what little research I've done on, on them. But I, I'll say that um, it is a credit tenant. Um, it does. It is in a great market. Um, it provides a vital need, you know, for the area and for the country, you could argue. So um, I, I think it's a tenant that's it's a sticky tenant. We allocated a 5% chance that they leave. You know, this is really your space. You know, you know, oil and gas far better than I do. Um, and so, you know, I think this trades, you, again, and Tyler, you and I are, are, have talked about this probably ad nauseum, um, and we're going to make some changes going forward to try to take uh, into account tax situations. But if you're in a 1031 right now, you know, and you're, you're, you're faced with paying, uh, you know, paying taxes on that or deferring taxes, you know, your, your negative leverage may be made up with the tax deferral that you're going to save, right? So there's a lot of ways to look at it, uh, but I definitely don't think this goes for an eight cap. You know, we should try to mark this um, and co go back and look and see, see what we, you know, see if we can find what it trades for. We should do that. We should, we should, we should definitely, we should make, put some money on it. We should make bets on what That's we think it's trade for. And then every six months we'll go back and see how close we were. Yeah, we should. Uh, now, Texas, Texas uh, doesn't have public information on, on, on purchase prices, but we could probably figure it out. Yeah, Talk we could find price. something. <laughs> My um, guess, you know, I would put, I would put a, a five dollar bill that this trades at around a seven two cap. Okay, let's trade it at a seven two. How does that look? I want to see. I want to see what somebody's gonna, what somebody's gonna get. Okay, seven two five, good enough. So if Winston's right. For the right buyer out there at a seven two, this is what you're going to get at fifty percent leverage. But not no. Here. But I'm saying it's probably going to be all cash, and okay. I, I think it's going to be all go. cash, <clears throat> and it's going to be a ten thirty one buyer that's that's all cash, and they just they're electing to to roll their funds into uh, what they view as a as a pretty stable industrial asset. Okay, then here's your all cash buyer, seven point two cap. They're going in. They got seven million bucks. They're putting it in. They're getting four seventy seven, four eighty a year for ten years, and they're cashing out basically for exactly what they put in. Mm -hmm. That's yep. the that's the bet. Yeah, yeah, but okay. but remember, they also get depreciation. Yeah, you know, on some of the assets. Um, you know, there, there's other advantages to holding this than just the cash flows that we're seeing here today. Yeah, you're right. Depreciation. Right. The income tax benefits, the uh, paying down that you know the equity on the building. So when we say selling it for what we paid for it, you know um, the tenants paying down the, the the principal, you're building up equity. You've got other other benefits than just the cash flows. Well, in this case, we're leverage free, right? So there's no no one's paying. Well, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're just getting these. You're just getting these four hundred and eighty thousand a year checks, and yeah. then. And again, because I, 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 I yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I, I never stop talking about rent increases because I literally, it literally kills deals for me just <laughs> because, because you're always going to have, a, not always like people who, who bought, who bought assets, what in 20, you know, in the mid 2010s, 2015, whatever. And they sold and they sold recently, like when the cap rates were at four, you know, they made bank, they bought it a six cap and sold it a four cap. Well, you got rich, but you can't. You know, you can't depend on cap rates going down to make no. money on a deal. It's just not, you can't do it. You have to assume cap rates will go up always um, because technically they should if market conditions don't change. You can't, you can't bet on changing market conditions. So, yeah. yeah. Well, good stuff. Good stuff, Tyler. Good. Yeah, man. I think we had a, it's a pretty good call. A lot of, a lot of interesting stuff with this deal. Um, 
I guess let's try and find, we'll try and find the most interesting deals we can. So we're not just underwriting uh, a rated tenants, you know, Starbucks every week and uh, you know, trying to uncover all of the, you know, weird and interesting things we find with these net lease deals. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, the cool thing about what we're trying to do here is just kind of introduce new concepts and, you know, what really is the net lease space, right? There's a lot of folks out there that just focus on urgent care purchases. They just focus on dollar generals. They just focus on Jack in the box. They love Jack in the box. They're going to buy every Jack in the box that they can. Right. Um, and that's okay. But you know, uh, the net lease sector is bigger than dollar general. And so our goal is just to kind of show that. All right. So, Hey, yeah, man. thanks Tyler. If anyone's interested in talking real estate, give us a shout. Until next week. Cheers, man. Cheers.